The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with this woman, but no one said, uh, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? The word of God. Please be seated. So this week, early on in this week, I was driving and Pastor Chris Hemen, uh, Pastor Steve Hemingway, not Chris Hemingway, because that's not his name. Pastor Steve Hemingway calls me out of the blue and he says, hey, I've got this fantastic idea. You are preaching for the baccalaureate for the academy kids. You're preaching for the baccalaureate of the university students in, in two weeks. And right in the middle is this random week where you're, you don't have either one of the universities here. But that's kind of like our motto at the church, right? The church between two campuses. And he says, wouldn't it be fantastic if you took that idea that you're preaching between the two campus events and, and created a, a metaphor about how we are a church that lives between, between generations, between races, between gender, between class. The, the struggle is real when we try to be the community of God. Wouldn't you just, isn't that a great idea? I said, no, it's a bad idea, bro. I hung up and then I immediately wrote it down. I was like, I'm going to take credit for this. So if you see Pastor Steve later, he did not come up with that idea. That was original. I believe that in order for us to live between generations, to live between genders, to live between class, to live between races, we must be intentional about our lives. Turn to someone and say, be intentional. Especially if they've been dating you for nine years. Turn to them and say, be intentional. <laughs> be intentional. David Fitch, author of Faithful Presence, contends that the church is more than a space where some individuals gather to affirm they believe in something. It is the place where God's people discern his presence and submit to Christ's concrete rule. He has given us disciplines for doing this. Here, a new world is born that is nothing less than his kingdom breaking in. Here, an incredible, faithful presence takes place shape here here between us god is breaking into the world here god is doing the things that that we have allotted him to do as a community he presses on us his agenda and we are to live that in mighty ways here is where we are shaped towards a faithful presence towards each other and to the world. Here's where we are driven, not just for affirmation that we believe in being Adventist or believe in Jesus or believe in that, that, that uh, you know, we have certain things or believe that we love. It's not enough for us to come together and just affirm that we believe in the same thing. I mean, otherwise, we get, you know, I'd come in and I'd be here and I, yep, you're right. I still believe in Jesus. Amen. I'm going home now. That's not enough. That does not fill our calling and our purpose. We come here to birth together God's initiative and his presence into the world. Here we are the corporeal, concrete, real body of God that takes purposeful action towards what is missio Dei. What is God being in the world, breaking through? What does that feel like? What does that look like? What does that smell like? What does it look like when we act in such a way? In so doing, we must be intentional. So here in the story of John chapter four, let's recap really quick so we're all on the same page. Jesus and the disciples traveled from Galilee, uh, traveled to Galilee from Judea via Samaria. They uh, get to a well in Sychar and the disciples go into town to get Jesus some food and themselves some food. Jesus meets a woman in the midday gathering water. 
He asks her for some water. They begin to talk about social structures and theology and life, and they talk about the whole gambit of things. She has an epiphany that he is the I am. This is a jo Johannine uh, a theme, right? The I am, this Old Testament God who was the, was the God who led the people. This is the God of Moses and, and Abraham. And so you, we hear this come up again. He is the I am. She has this epiphany. The disciples show back up at that moment. They get a little weirded out. It's a little bit awkward. Jesus is there with the woman at the well, but they don't know how to approach the conversation, so they let it go. She leaves, goes back into town to tell the people the disciples brought Jesus food. Jesus straightens them out about what his real food looks like. They don't show up again, the disciples, in this text ever again. It's just the end of it. The author does not write about them again. She brings back the whole village from her engagement with them, and many accept Jesus. This is the synopsis of this particular story. In our time today, we want to focus on the portion where she has the epiphany and the disciples return. Here are two things to consider as we read this story and why I believe the story talks about the intentionality of God. And as implications of that, we must be intentional about our activities as followers of God. Julie bid me. Professor in Religious Studies at Chapman University points out that although the primary function of wells in ancient Israel was to supply water for the household, the centralized open location of wells allowed them to serve as social gathering places. Wells were also places of betrothal scenes as the young women likely went out together to collect water. Young men of the village realized that this event gave them the perfect opportunity to socialize with these young women away from the watchful eyes of the fathers and the male relatives. Our very own Dr. Kendra Holoviak, uh, from her book, Signs to Life, wrote this. Like his ancestors, Jesus goes to a foreign land, to Samaritan land, and he sat down at a well. Could it be that the author of the fourth gospel is setting his readers up to think that Jesus was looking for a wife? For those who knew the stories of Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel, Moses and Zipporah, it seemed to be exactly what Jesus was doing. The disciples seemed to assume that would happen at, at, at past wells, also going on at this time. Probably given, them, given their understanding of the Messiah as an earthly ruler, Jesus seeking a wife was not a bad thing. But this particular woman was a huge problem. A Samaritan cannot be part of Jesus' family. She was not an acceptable bride. Interesting, as we consider the text, Verse 27, just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do, you, what do you want? Or why are you speaking to her? Then the woman left with her jar and went back to the city. And the story goes on. I love this part. I just consider the disciples, and they're, they're, they're walking back to Jesus, and they notice uh, just as a surprise that Jesus is talking with a woman at the well. And for the hearers of the text, this reminds them that wells are places where people get betrothed. Wells are places where people uh, begin to arrange relationships of marriage. And could you just imagine how blown away they are? They're so blown away that John has to put it into the text. He writes it in. They were astonished. Why, why is Jesus doing this? And yet they couldn't ask him because it was too awkward. Have you ever been in a position where you, you got into a situation where it was really awkward, you were surprised, but you didn't know how to ask about it? Have you ever been there? So I, I, I grew up in a house, so I have a brother. He's older than me. He's about, he's about eight years older than me. And uh, he's married his beautiful wife and have been married about 10 years. But I want to tell you how we first met. Because I had never, never seen my brother ever date anyone before his wife. He's eight years older than me, so he's kind of like my superhero. You know, I looked up to him. He's kind of a strong, stoic guy. One time, he was making a, a, a bed for himself. He picked up the table saw, the table saw, and is cutting it like a, like a normal giant would, I guess. He ran over his finger, and it just took, fell over. So he decides he's going to sit down and watch TV because his show was on before he goes to the hospital. 
this is my brother. I'd never seen him show emotions towards uh, another person. I'd never seen him show that love, that intimacy. And I came back, I, we were here at La Sierra. I came back from traveling uh, for the university. And when I came back, I came back to our house and there she was, a female, sitting on the couch, just watching TV with Rolando. And I walked in, I said, oh look, Rola is helping one of the students, great. I went to put myself away, I came back and she's sitting there. Three hours later, she's still sitting on the couch. The TV is, is some commercialized, like, random, hey, buy this skirt for, there's nothing good on the TV, and she's still sitting on the couch. And I thought, oh, this is strange. Finally, she gets up to leave, and as she gets up to leave, I said, okay, great. And then I see her lean over to my brother and give him this, like, elongated hug. I said, oh my goodness, is, is, is this, what, what, but I couldn't ask him, so all I did was follow him around for a whole week to see what was happening, and I'd notice her with him, I said, man, something's going on, I should just ask him, but it's too awkward, I can't do it. Finally, we were riding in his car, and I was sitting in the back, and, and as we were getting to the place, he leans over and kisses her on the cheek, and I just knew with that moment, oh, dang, I love. And I yelled out from the back, I knew it. This is awkward. I'm the third wheel. Can you imagine the disciples? Hey, Jesus, we brought you some bread, and oh, snap. Hello, lady. Ask him. No, I don't want to ask him. Just, it's just weird. Are they going to get married? I don't know. This is what they do. I don't know. You can imagine just how weird this is. But the thing is, it's even, it's even more tense because um, the relationship of Jesus and a Samaritan woman is just not kosher. Why, Jesus? Why would you have this kind of relationship? I mean, there are tons of wells in Galilee. We could have stopped at a well in Judea, but you decided on Sikkar. These are people who, who we, don't, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't mix with. They're half-breeds. They're from intermarriages. They were born less than us. Why now? Jesus doesn't care what people think. Secondly, there's been much discussion over the years about the common route for Jews of Jesus' day to travel between Galilee and Judea. Healthy dialogue often, often uh, would have the Jews in Jesus' day detour around the Jordan River and go up through Perea and then back across to get into um, the towns that they were moving between. Because these people didn't want to mix with the Samaritans because Samaria was right between Judea and Galilee. So they didn't want to have to see these folks. So they would go around. You know that you don't like someone when you are willing to go the extra mile so that you don't see them. Has anyone ever been ghosted before? Go ahead and say amen. Worst feeling ever, right? You ever try to text somebody who just won't text you back? Yeah, Steve Hemingway, I know. You text, you text, they don't want to text, and like, they completely goes you. These people, you know, it's not like they had cars where they could drive. This is, a, you know, they, they were walking. You know you don't like somebody when you are willing to walk that much further not to talk to these people. I hate walking. I probably should do it a little bit more. But we're a society that doesn't work, walk, so we get that. Now, you want to drive to, like, the front parking space as close as you can so you can get out and go to the gym. If you could, I could, you know, we just, we just drive everywhere. We don't want to walk. These people literally walked around Samaria. This is how much they did not like these other people. Jesus walks straight into Sikar, does not take the customary route. He stops at the well in Samaria. So this to us means one of two things. Either Jesus is lazy, which is a possibility. Maybe he's like, yo guys, my legs hurt. I'm not gonna walk around this time. We're just gonna walk through. That, or he was intentional. Or he was intentional about where he was going and who he wanted to see and who he wanted to be with. He didn't care what other people thought. He didn't care that they were gonna talk about his route. 
He didn't care that, that they were uh, going to talk about who he was sitting at with the well. He just wanted to be there because he had the intentions to reach these people. Oh, I wish the church wouldn't care so much. Oh, I wish that we wouldn't care what people thought so much. Oh, I wish that we wouldn't worry about what another church would say about us or what another, another faith community would say about us. Oh, I, I wish that we would just on God's agenda just run and, and, and go into this world transforming lives for Jesus. Turn to somebody and say, don't care so much. Tell somebody else, don't care so much. You know, when we used to leave the church, my mom, my mom is an old school Adventist. I'm like, I'm like sixth generation Adventist. Anybody like six generations or more here? Yeah, I, hey, hey, we might be related, bro. Not really. But, my, you know, so I'm like, like sixth generation Adventist. Like, you know, my, my great grandmother's grandmother came over in the Pit Karen, like the first Voyager boat that the Adventists had. You know, my, my family came over there to Tonga. My mom is super Adventist, and like, she super doesn't like to play around. You know what I mean? She's not, she doesn't listen. Church is not for the playing around. My mom used to get up like early in the morning, like before the sun rose to wake us up to go to church. And before the sun rose, she would wake us up to go 10 minutes to a church that was right there. And she'd say, hey, get up. Why? You gotta go to church. Mom, the sun isn't up. Get up. Get up or else. You never wanted to hear or else because you knew what was coming after that. And then my mom would be like, when you get to church, you better act right. And, and, and when, when you get to church and somebody says happy Sabbath, what do you say back to them? Oh, you didn't have my mom. You'd have been quick to say happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. When they say happy Sabbath, you say happy Sabbath or else. Oh, shoot, mom. And sometimes she'd spank us before we go to church, right? Just in case. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just in case. You got a mom like that? Look. Ah! In case you want to get out of control. Think about the pain. <laughs> that was my mom. So we come to church, people are like, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath to you. <laughs> Your mom is so sweet. No, she's not. <laughs> she's crazy. Right? This was my mom. I talked, by the way, if you haven't noticed as we go along, I talk about people all the time. I tell stories. If you get into my story, it's because I love you. All right? This was the household we grew up in. It was, hey, don't tell nobody your business. Don't, don't, don't act out of control and look like we got everything together. Whatever you do, look like you got it together. So when somebody says, how are you? Praise the Lord, God is good. Is he? I don't know, I'm dying inside. <laughs> Maybe sometimes as Christians, we just care too much what other people think. What if we didn't care so much about what other people felt? What if we cared more for what God was thinking? What if we asked God to just press down on us like a community and do some amazing things? How much more powerful of a people could we be? Turn to somebody and say, don't care so much. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't care so much. Jesus was on a mission. He was taking a particular route for a particular reason because he wanted to run into particular people who would do particular things. And I think that kind of speaks to us as Adventists because we like being particular. We use the word peculiar, but we mean particular. And peculiar is kind of a strange adage, right? Because you would never introduce your best friend to somebody you want them to marry if they were peculiar. Like, oh, you got a friend? I do. Really? What's he like? He's peculiar. <laughs> but particular, peculiar in the sense of particularity, of, 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 of a gem, of something fresh, a treasure. Like there's, there's belonging, there's ownership there, right? This is what Jesus was doing. He was intentional about this. And so he goes in this route. When they stop in Sikar, the disciples, they go to town to bring Jesus some food because they didn't realize how intentional Jesus was being. They didn't realize that Jesus had a purpose and a mission, that he was going there for a reason. They were just used to their regular scheduled traveling. So when they went to town, they went to town to get food for Jesus. They missed out on all the people that were hungry for living bread. 
They missed out on all the people in the town who were thirsty for living water because they were after their own hunger and their own thirst. Sometimes as a church, we are so preoccupied with our hunger and our thirst that we miss those who are looking for the living bread. They're out there. They're in town. But Jesus has a very particular conversation with this woman. He has it because he believes that she's going to do something special, not just for her, but for the whole community. She's the one who gets to go back into the community after she realizes that he is the God, that he is the I am, that he is the Alpha Omega. She goes back, and the reason why the village follows her is because she understands their hunger. She understands their thirst for the living water. This is the place she's at. And so she's able to connect. The disciples, in contrast, don't get it. They, Jesus, we brought you some bread. It's delicious. It'll feed your hunger. And Jesus and them have an impasse because they don't understand. Jesus wasn't there for the delightful, delicious pastries that Sikar has. He was there to transform lives. Could that be our calling, church? Could it be sometimes that we're so comfortable that we miss out on the desire of others? Could it be like this young lady who to the disciples meant a lot? She is indeed a person in life who has been struggling in reality, but she's also more than that. She represents a part of what is familiar to the disciples, right? Her, her, her half and half blood. They, they recognize parts of her that's familiar. But then she also represents to the disciples a part that is unconventional, that is different, that is unacceptable to the disciples' comforts. And so Jesus stops at this place, not just for his own sake, but to help them recognize their own bias towards comfort, their own prejudice towards having something that makes them feel good about who they are, the, the feeding of themselves and not recognizing the need for others who are different than them to be able to come and share in the same glories that they are allotted. Maybe as a church we are too often wrapped up in keeping our church and our service and our space flowing the way we like it that we miss out on what God really desires for all of us together. The disciples missed the point on this trip. They didn't realize the intentionality behind it, so they were so on cruise mode. They were so living in the self-preservation mode. They were so comfortable that they didn't see a whole village of people, of others, of different, of new, of weird. It's a great reminder that being stuck to Jesus means being mindful not to be stuck in our own ways. It's a great reminder for us to be able to allow the gospel story to be larger than us, to be more magnificent and mysterious and beautiful and transforming and inclusive. This is what it means to be an ecclesia. We're not always going to understand the other very well. But we follow Jesus into these places and we watch him love deeply. We watch him transform lives and then together we move with him into these spaces as uncomfortable as it may be so that we too can be life transformers. It may mean we hear music that is awkward and weird to us. The older I get, the less I understand praise. Somebody say amen. And I love praise. I've always loved praise. But the older I get, I'm like, I can't, I, I can't follow that song. It's too tricky for me. Right? And then raise your hands. Okay, I'm raising my hands. Put them down. Okay, I'm putting them down. Raise your hands. Oh, my Lord. Wait, what am I doing? Tell us. And yet I realize that if I don't make space for the next generation... When I go, so does the church. And I want a church of next generation. I want a church for my kids. Somebody say amen. I want them to grow up and marry somebody in the church. I want them to have little Adventist babies. I want them to have haystack parties. 
I want them to enjoy Sabbath. And if it means me moving out of their way and me supporting that and me helping that grow, that's what I'm going to do. My mom said to me, my mom loves ties. If you love ties, just say amen. I'm praying for your soul. My mom loves ties. Man, she loves ties, man. She loves, you know. And so when we were growing up in church, we always wore a tie. Always wore a tie. It didn't matter if you were in church or at Vespers or if you were playing the game night on Saturday night. We were playing basketball in the gym with ties on and church shoes. Have you ever tried to play basketball in church shoes? It's like ice skating, bro. Let me tell you. My mom didn't play around. You always dress. You stay dressed. That's how you stay ready for the Lord. You got to stay ready. If you're going to see the president, you'd be dressed up. I know, but the president's not my dad. <laughs> well, it's, you got to dress up, right? So in my, in my journey, I, um, I was praying one day, and I just said, you know what? Um, I ran into someone who said, you don't really, you shouldn't do ministry. You, you look different. The way you preach is different. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. You don't have any real connections. Maybe you should think about a different position in your life. And I said, oh, well, well, praise the Lord. You are not God, and I'm going to follow God's calling. And I went back to my room and I was crying and I prayed about it and prayed about it. And I said, God, I want to be your servant, but I, I, I can't be anyone else. I, I don't look like this individual. I don't look like that individual. I don't preach like that. God, you got to just use me the way I am. If you do, I promise I'll follow you. And I, I literally heard God say, that's exactly who I want you to be. So I decided I'm going to follow God. And I'm going to carve out my own path the way that I see fit. The problem is God didn't send that memo to my mom. Right. So, I wish he would have, because that would have made my job a lot easier. First time she came to hear me preach, you know, at a place, it was, you know, she came in, and I was just wearing my outfit, and I saw her coming in, she's like, hey, I'm, yeah, that's my son preaching, hey, that's, that's. <laughs> She just stopped in the back, just looked at me. It was the longest sermon I ever preached in my life. I was afraid to see her afterwards, so I just kept preaching like two days later, and the Lord said, go back to the text, everybody, back to the text, right? This is my mom. So I don't like ties. I love ties, but I don't wear ties very often. My daughter, a couple months ago, walks up to me. She says, Dad, we're going to go to church? I said, yeah, I'm going to go preach. She's like, can I come with you? Let's go. She goes to the closet. She says, Dad, I want you to wear a tie. I said, spirit of your grandmother, how dare you? How dare you? She said, Dad, you'll look good with a tie on. Just put it on. I said, you are not my mother. She said, come on, Dad. You know what I did. You know what I did to that girl? I put the tie on. And I wore it proudly. Because even though I don't like ties, I want my daughter to know that I believe in her. That I trust her judgment. And if she thinks I look good with a tie on, I'm going to wear a tie. The whole Sabbath, I was like, the Lord, I can't, I can't breathe, Jesus. My daughter's just beautiful dad, beautiful. <laughs> Sometimes we have to sit in our uncomfortableness so that the next generation has space to comfortably grow and be a part of this amazing movement. And it doesn't mean that we forget where we came from. It doesn't mean the disciples had to all of a sudden live in Samaria. It did mean that the disciples had to make room for a whole village of new others to come into the space. And it doesn't look the same as the way we like it to look always. It might look like a baptism on Founders Green with Pastor Jason and one of our young collegiate Christian who decided he would give his life to God because he was doing service in the community and it just made sense. It may, it may look like a bunch of, of, of academy students sitting in this space recognizing that they just did it and the church applauds them for getting this far. It may, it may look like uh, uh, my guy, Kareem, who, who, did, uh, who spoke at uh, a, a student-led worship service up at the university. He, he came to me last night. He's like, hey, pastor, you know, I preached uh, uh, last week at the, I don't remember what the clarity, it's called clarity. I said, man, that's awesome. You spoke. He said, yeah, I preached, right? And I was like, okay. He's like, you want to watch it? And I was like, not really but okay, I will. And he says, this is how you do it. Go on to Instagram. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no idea how to use Instagram correctly. 
He's like, check it out. Look, let me, and then he, he got there and he added me in and I was watching him preach and I said, yo, this is the next gen. They're doing some things here. Are we tuning in to what the others are beginning to do? What the next iteration is beginning to do? Are we making space so that those who understand the cultural language of the village, empowering them so they can go back and bring the village in? Or maybe, maybe it's like this beautiful intimate service that I enjoyed last week on Friday. They call it the Lavender Lapel Ceremony, held here across the way, where LGBTQIA plus graduates came together, just a few of them. They, they just sat in this room. Come on up, praise team. And just a few of them. And they were affirmed, not just for graduating, but they were affirmed that God loved them. And I thought to myself, why do we have them sitting all the way over there to hear that God loves them? Church, what's wrong with us when we, 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 we exclude people from God's kingdom? You know, we should all just be grateful we're making it. <laughs> and I often say to myself, man, God, if you let me into the kingdom, I, I should just be grateful enough to say, God, I, I, you, you can let anyone into the kingdom. You know what they had? They had this group called, I, I don't exactly know, it's, it's something like Moms for hugs. It's these mothers, these parents, who adopts these graduates because their families won't come. Their families have disowned them. And so these moms, strangers, right? They come dressed, they have big hearts, and every time one of, the, one of these graduates were we're going up, one of these moms would be standing there, arms wide open, celebrating this child of God, hugging. Oh, what if the church didn't care about what anybody else thought, but that we would love like Jesus. We don't have all the answers figured out, but one thing we can do is love like Jesus. So the story goes quiet at the end. I don't, I don't know how the disciples responded, right, to this whole Samaritan onslaught of people that they thought were unclean. I think we like the story because we're like, man, she, she's the first Christian evangelist, man. She changed lives. Praise the Lord. All these Samaritans came. But I think uh, if we put that into like contemporary context and somebody brought in a bunch of people that we did not like, we'd be like, oh, Jesus, no. Too much. But it doesn't tell us what the disciples did. Maybe they were silent because they were in awe of the beauty and the bounty of God's exuberant love that he would be there in service and sacrifice to that community. And it transformed them. I don't know what the disciples did. But I think maybe the author left it open to help us in our crossroads to decide what are we gonna do when we are in the place called to be more loving and to love like Jesus. I pray that we are an intentional church that loves deeply as the heart of God does. Pray with me. Oh Lord, we come before you humbly, not understanding all things, knowing that our ways are not yours, that we are finite and passing. And yet we've heard you tell us that the world would know us by our love. So today I pray that you would fall afresh on us, that you would bring us back together communally under you, 
that we would follow you to the uncomfortable places so that we can reach particular people for particular reasons in this particular time. Bless us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Let all God's people say, amen.